there was no VC out there that definitively said, we believe in crowdfunding and community backed fundraising so much that we are going to make a venture fund that exclusively invests into crowdfunding startups. You know, I'm someone who comes from the online content and entertainment space and community in those areas is everything. If you don't have an audience, you don't have a community, your channel is good as dead. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of Next Big Thing HQ, where we interview founders and showcase startups raising capital via Reg CF. Today, we have a great guest with you. We have Tristan Chambers. Tristan is the solo GP of Spark. He's currently building GRFK Co. and the CEO of Awaken Militia. Tristan, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Connor. So let's just get started with being the solo GP of Spark. What type of companies are you investing in? So we invest really in a wide variety. I think the only industries that we haven't touched are hard tech and anything to do with military um, applications. And I think a little bit of biomed as well. Basically, any industry that probably has like really high like regulations is where we kind of stay away from. I grew up in a military family, so I know how hard it is to compete with like the existing military contractors out there. So like that's the biggest reason why we we don't focus on those areas. But everything from prop tech to SaaS to theater space to media and entertainment companies to, you know, whatever you could think of. If it's out there and if it's in a space that, again, isn't the three that I mentioned, we'll probably take a look at you. So what are you looking for in these startups before you invest? Let's just say at the very top level, what is the first filter that these startups have to pass through in order to get to the next phase before you consider investing? You know, that's a good question. For me, what I really look at is, are you trying to tell a story or are you trying to, you know, accurately pitch a company to people? Secondly, I look at the background of the founders. That I think is actually more important than whether or not you're telling a story or actively trying to raise, you know, professionally, because you don't want a founder who's got marketing and you know, brand management experience running, um, you know, a, a coffee startup or some other kind of weird, you know, consumer group. So like, that's something I look at heavily is, you know, what's your background, what's your you know degree, if you have one in, and then, you know, going from there, you know, figuring on my end, like, how would that apply to what you're currently doing with this new startup? And how big are these portfolios I saw for this year? You invested in around 20 companies? Yeah. So last year we did about 25 companies. I think that was on par with what we did in 2022 as well. This year is going to be a little bit more, to be honest. We plan on doing 25 and then some of the other aspects of Spark because, you know, we're not a venture fund, but we're also a player in the Web3 and publicly traded digital asset, and we're also a, a player in the pre-IPO stage. So when you say a player in the pre-IPO stage, are you looking at maybe trading, buying some shares, some stock in secondary markets? Is that what you're thinking about before a company goes public? Or are you thinking about maybe investing in a startup after the seed stage in like a series A, series B? So that's a good question. We have considered about doing secondary markets. I think secondary markets are a fantastic arena that we want to play in obviously you know valuations for a lot of startups do need to come down because that's something that we've seen like across the board with a lot of startups whether you're raising reg cf or not i think secondary markets have also had a really big beating last few months whether it was back when the open ai tender was going to happen or even you know very recently with some others As far as how we do with the pre-IPO stage, we work with um, institutions out there, whether it's like SoFi or a few others, that give people access to investing before the IPO launches, then we can capitalize on those things. 
sometimes we've had it where we've been offered um, involvement into SPAC transactions. We respectfully have passed on those just because the way that the SPAC market has been the last few years did not go well for anybody, <laughs> really. And also, I think that there's just some, you know, very nuanced things that people don't understand about SPAC transactions compared like to if you were regularly like IPOing. Can you elaborate on the couple of the nuances? Yeah. So, you know, for instance, there was a, a company we were going to invest in. I won't name the name of them, um, but they were going to go public on the stock market through a, a SPAC transaction. And, you know, they were setting the share price on the campaign at, you know, $5 a share. That, you know, stock, though, that they're merging via SPAC transaction with is publicly trading right now at $10 a share. But then also, they were going to require, you know, when we talk to them, a six month lockup. Most SPACs within six months lose 70, 80% of their value. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's only a few that I can think of who maybe lost 20 to 30 or 40% of their value. And those are sort of the outliers because those are in business markets that are, you know, backed pretty nicely. So it's those kind of things where we take a look at that and go like, hey, I'm used to what SPAC transactions are like. I know these are more volatile than compare them volatile to options trading, but knowing at the end of the day, like you're definitively losing money mm -hmm. because these SPACs are never going to go up. If you have to hold it for six months and you can't sell. Exactly. The, it look, look, um, but, so but, but even then, like, as I told somebody, why would I buy that company's stock? off of a campaign deal with a six month lockup and watch my share, shares drop 70% when I could actively right now go buy that stock at full price of $10 a share on any brokerage and I can sell whenever I wish. Ladder makes so much more sense. Exactly. So. That and also I think a lot of people um, that, that work in traditional finance are very keen to always mention it on TMBC or Bloomberg whenever they, you know, talk about the bags is there's a lot of financial information and a lot of material information. We obviously saw this with Chamath and some of the facts that he promoted. You know, some of them then disclose, hey, we're being under investigation for XYZ reasons. You know, those, those like are some... should know that, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, hey, um... Probably some of us should know of like th this is happening, but those are some of the nuances. And, you know, I'm a believer in SPAC. I think they're great. I just think that they're also fundamentally flawed. Mm -hmm. Because of the disclosures are more or less. Well, not only that, but a lot of the incentive behind SPACs, taking companies public through an ulterior method is a great concept. Don't get me wrong. I just don't think that the companies that were being chosen back in the 2020, 2021 SPAC craze were fundamentally sound companies. A lot of them were what you would consider micro cap or companies that otherwise would have been on, you know, over the counter. Yep. Yeah. And also, I think there was a lot of bad financial decisions being made 2020, 2021 just because there was so much free money around. And if you look at some of the valuations exactly. of the private companies, it was ridiculous. But I do want to pivot to talk more about equity crowdfunding. What, sure. is your, what is your perspective on equity crowdfunding and where do you see it going in the next five years? You know, that, that's a very good question. Um, as far as equity crowdfunding goes, I'm a big supporter of it, right? And, you know, I am someone who really believes in the vision and, like, the actual value of having startups that are backed by their community and really being able to go out there, make a statement of, hey, we raised from our users, our community, our customers. I think that's a really interesting thing, especially for like the first time founders out there who maybe don't have connections to VC, who can't, you know, get off the ground because VCs are not backing first time founders. Um, so I think that's a really, you know, fun thing. I think that some of the ways in which we've seen um, crowdfunding 
whether it's being done through like how WeFunder does SPVs, which are more akin to what you see with traditional uh, venture investing models, whether it's Republic who has done different versions of it, right? Where they tokenize the sale. They've done uh, the Reg CF. They've done Reg A. You see, we have WeFunder doing multiple types of different investing options, whether it's um, equity shares, whether it's crowd states, whether it's convertible notes. Um, so I think a lot of these traditional fundraising methods coming into Reg CF is a really great thing. And I think that there's a lot of a uh, promise to the the overall reg cf space yeah and you invest in the reg cf space a lot i yes. was looking at your fund and i'm pretty sure most of them if not all of them were raising a reg cf all so, of them i can tell you that um well, yeah, <laughs> and, so. and there's a very big reason for that when i was looking at getting in the venture cap right with spark we didn't want to just be another venture fund out there um, because there's all sorts of different ones out there. And, you know, it's not a knock on any of them, but there was no VC out there that definitively said, we believe in crowdfunding and community backed fundraising so much that we are going to make a venture fund that exclusively invests into crowdfunding startups. You know, I'm someone who comes from the online content and entertainment space and community in those areas is everything. If yeah. you don't have an audience, you don't have a community, your channel is as good as dead. And so I feel like us being one of the only, if not probably the only major player that is exclusively investing into crowdfunding startups. Like I know there's one or two other ones out there as well, but we're the more transparent on, hey, this is who we're investing into. X, Y, and Z. Like we, every time we make an investment, we post it out on, on LinkedIn. We add it to the website, everything. But ultimately, yeah, like I is the still like room in this space that you could create a, a VC that, you know, nobody was really paying attention to. And so you do that and you've invested in three companies that I've interviewed their founders Jibby created and Nada. So let's talk about uh, let's talk about Jibby first. Sure. What was your reasoning behind investing in Jibby? So what's funny is, is so we were going to invest in Jibby regardless, but um, it was also because there was a previous company on WeFunder we considered investing into and backing out to make sure we have room for a few other companies that we knew were coming down the pipeline. Um, cause we're, we're always looking at like expiration dates and our quarterly spend. And so for me, what, what was nice about Jibby compared to a lot of these like mushroom focused brands or CPG brands is they weren't just trying to corner one market. They weren't just going, Hey, all of our, you know, eggs are in this mushrooms basket. They were focused on coffee and this and that and mushrooms. So for me, I thought that's a really great thing. Um, I love the fact that they already had retail distribution in a lot of different places, plus the fact that they were already scaling their products to non-mushroom related stuff was a really great thing. Great brand on social media. Could they be doing better? Yes, absolutely. Every startup could be doing better on social media. But we really loved as well that uh, the brand felt consumer friendly at the same time. The logo so, makes you happy. E exactly. Um, so those are the things that we looked at with Jibby. And, you know, we also do a lot of diving into the um, investor prospectus and, you know, all the finances, at, which, you know, personally is not my favorite thing to do. But ultimately, we think it's a really great investment opportunity. Have you tried their uh, their matcha? I've been meaning to, like, I am someone who is normally not a coffee guy. Anyone that knows me historically knows I am a avid connoisseur of, like, caffeine and mostly sodas and energy drinks. Like, coffee is only something that, like, in the last few months, I really, like, made an effort to be like, let's try this at least. You should order it and just uh, try it. I got their green matcha, and it, it's a little different at first, but it's... uh. It's a pretty unique feeling. 
where you feel calm, but you also feel focused. So it's a very good balance Sure. where you don't feel amped up. Like sometimes when I drink coffee, I get really amped up and it's not a good amped up. It's kind of a very frantic amped up where this is more calm, but focused. And I thought that was really interesting. I, I love the branding of the that, can. That was another big reason that we like invested into them was because we loved the actual premise of how like the formula works mm-hmm. where it's not like, okay, Hey, you're, you're drinking this coffee and like, it's good for like an hour. And then you like, there's like a placebo effect to, to things you see with other brands that, you know, involve mushrooms or other sorts of, yep. um, aptogens. Like that was something that we really looked at w- with JB and we thought like, Hmm, they've actually done the science on this and that makes sense. Yeah. And so when you look at these companies that are raising capital via Reg CF, sure. I'm sure you're also looking at the social media because social media plays such a big yeah. impact behind the raise because they're trying to get the people in the community to invest in them and to really basically share some of the wealth when they continue to grow and get more successful later on. Right. So I guess, what are you looking at in the social media? And then do you see certain industries playing, uh, being more effective in reg CF than other industries? So that's a very good question. So what I look for is what is your social media strategy? Right. Like if you're on TikTok, are you doing user generated content with other users? Um, you know, are you, if you're on Instagram, are you ad spending, you know, and is, is, is that working well? Um, I look at the frequency of posts because like, I know some companies that what they were doing was like, they would pause for like six months. And then like, in that meantime, we go do like a, a reg CF and then say like, oh, we're pausing so that our, our media you know, spend is for later this year. And it's, it's like, okay, that's fine and all, but you're losing six months of proper, you know, attention right. to the product. Yeah. I look at as well, um, you know, what is the wording of the posts that you do on social media? Like, are you, you know, typing something that feels very corporate or is it something that is very personal, relatable and engaging? Um, like that's a very big distinction that a lot of people don't have because most founders never understand personal and, and brand marketing and, and conception outside of like, you know, uh, a name and a logo. So that's something that I, I look at a lot. Going back on the point when you talked about the wording, if there's not a necessarily right or wrong answer. No, it there, there's on not. The person but, marketing, right? Yeah. Like there's not a specifically right or wrong way of doing things, but what I have found most times from my experience working in, in marketing, from working in, you know, entertainment and, and brand is that there's a certain language and a certain tone, especially like if you're dealing with like creators on like marketing campaigns or just in general, that you can tell if someone's being authentic and mm-hmm. relatable yeah. and engaging versus, hey, we told you or we've written out this marketing and there's no room to budge on this or the same thing where if it's just a company posting on social media or Twitter, there's no like understanding really between or most founders really aren't thinking of like, how do we engage a certain audience? What's the way that they talk? What's the way that they consume content and so like that's what i mean you know like if you fed charlie d'amelio a a script uh for you know whatever product it is one she's going to tell you no and then secondly say like if you're going to want to work with me like it's going to be in an authentic and engaging way uh the same thing with social media i find that so many companies uh, even some of the more multinational companies that aren't reg CF, like, you know, your Pepsi's Coke of the world, they're so focused on this corporatized message. It doesn't emit like a feeling or a response or some kind of intrigue. Example I always give is, you know, I'm someone who's, you know, a fan of the rock music space. There's a story of how Monster for so many years 
you know, like bands didn't want to drink Monster Energy on stage. Well, what Monster did was they filled up cans of Monster Energy with water, gave them to the bands so that while the bands are on stage and they're drinking Monster, you and the crowd would think like, oh my God, my favorite band or my favorite artist is drinking Monster. I got to go grab myself a Monster Energy can. So it's things like that where like the marketing or the, you know, the way that it's being delivered to social media, um, whether it's from a company's page or in conjunction with, you know, an, a third party, it has to be relatable. It has to be authentic to some degree. Yep. I couldn't agree more. And I think, uh, I think you could probably still get away with the corporate language on maybe LinkedIn just because that's the natural audience of LinkedIn. But I think Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, especially TikTok, like you have to be you. And now, especially uh, our generation, it's gotten really good at sensing the bullshit. Exactly. And knowing who's being <laughs> authentic and then who's just trying to chase the bag or just grow their numbers and hit, you know, hit their metrics. And exactly. I realized, you know, social media is only a tool if you know how to use it and if you do it right. Like just because you post a bunch of videos isn't going to get you anywhere. You have to have a plan and know who you're targeting, know who you're going after. So, yeah, exactly. I think exactly. I think that's uh fascinating. So, you're investing in these Reg CF startups. How much are you deploying? So we don't actively tell our numbers, and there's a very big reason for why. Like What's even when we're talking with founders, we don't disclose our check sizes. Reason why is. I think it's great for transparency's sake. We want to focus more on bringing value to startups than whatever the finances could be. I'm a big fan of Gary Vee, and one of his favorite things he loves to say is bring 51% of the relationship to the client at any time or to anybody in, in life. Bring 51% of the value in that engagement. So we understand when we're investing in Reg CF, like we don't always have a lot of money to, to invest. Um, so what's the value add? The value add is that obviously like my background, the last 10 years being in marketing, being in online content, working with startups, being a founder myself, understanding a lot of the challenges of how to grow sustainably while not, you know, incurring a, a large burn rate. Um, also the fact that we have connections to other VCs with way deeper pockets than us. But also it's the, the fact that we think, you know, scrappy and different. When a lot of VCs, that was a really big thing that mentors of mine have taught me is to be very entrepreneurial and very smart and scrappy with the way that things are done and, you know, be more strategic. Like there's a, a quote that I've sort of coined on Twitter where it is that the smartest will outlive the spenders. So if you're smart in the way that you deploy capital and in, in how you're raising capital and where that capital is being allocated, founding side, we've perfected that with, with some of the startups that we've either launched or are working with. I also mentor startups as well, and I teach that same philosophy to them as, as well. Is like, just because you have 500000 a million, $2 million in cash on hand or that you've raised 5 million in seed or, you know, series A funding doesn't mean go and blow that in, you know, 18 months, extend that out to, you know, 24 to 36 months. What do you usually suggest founders to have their run rate at? So I typically suggest if you're trying to go for long-term and build sustainably and have small but steady growth, you do it at a 24 to 36 month, you know, rate. And that way, you know, hey, for the next two years, this is two to three years, this is what we can play with. And this is how we can do things. We can build off of what we already have done. And, you know, like, does that mean necessarily that we might come not come out with a new product or we might be, you know, spending more money on marketing this product that's been out for, you know, six months to a year already. Sure. Do that. That's fine. Right. That's a big thing that I think works out for a lot of people. Um, if you're somebody who is in, you know, hard tech and AI, 24 to 36 months can do a lot for you. 
you're you're running some of these other companies that we we've invested into. Um, 24 to 36 months is, I think, a very fair number. I say that for not just if you're a late stage company, like a series A or B, but if you're a pre-seed or seed company or bridging between um, seed to series, go with 24 to 36 months. Like the founders Better want to, to play see... safe than sorry, right? Exactly. Like, and, and not only that, but investors want to see that you have built out a roadmap that is going to last, you know, seven to 10 years at a minimum, because like that's the typical exit time for most startups is seven to 10 years, or there's some startup where it's taken them 10 years to become profitable. Um, and, and so like that, you know, that's something I teach with a lot of, uh, startups that I've worked with is like, be sustainable. Don't spend beyond your means. Like, you know, and lastly, like, think about how how you're doing things. Yeah. All right. So let's pivot to talk about digital, regulated digital uh, securities. Sure. Or digital tokens. What do you think the role that sec- uh, regulated sec- uh, digital tokens will play in the future and why is it important? So there are a lot better people that are suited for this question than, than myself, especially if they deal in in securities transactions and in law my personal feelings is that like it deepens the playing field for both um everyday investors and retail investors um to to be involved right whether it's like what republic did with the republic no whether it's you know like what we've seen with a lot of um Web3 companies launching their own tokens and giving a, a sort of, you know, quasi like equity in, into the company. Um, I think that those are really big things that have really impacted the way that digital asset raising is done. I mean, um, just like we have the IPOs uh, for stock markets, you know, the, the digital space has ICOs and airdrops and, you know, um, have have utilized platforms like Republic as well. Yeah. So I think that's a really important thing. Um, Is it usually a rev share vehicle? Y- you know, know the so, Republic node is, right? Yeah, so Republic node is a rev share. I know with some of the other ones, they're more of you buy in the, the token. Um, I know some of them, I can't speak for every single one of them out there, because I don't know all the tokenomics on things. At, at some point in time, you, you just stop reading the tokenomics for a lot of Web3 startups. So, so that there's not like brain rot at the end yeah. of the day. Talk about, I saw you bought uh, XRP. So now we'll talk yeah. about cryptocurrency a little bit. Explain XRP, maybe like the functionality, why you think it's important and kind of what excites you, especially lately because the crypto market has been pretty exciting as of the last couple months. Yeah, you know, that was one of our first that we decided to do in the publicly traded digital asset space. And I'll kind of touch on why we we decided to do that, because, you know, obviously it seems like a really interesting pivot. CF startups to that. We realized that some of these bigger, like, venture funds out there, like Sequoia, like um, A16, and, and a few others out there, we're doing, you know, half and half equity or half and half, you know, half equity, half tokens. FTX, you know, famously was invested by Sequoia. Uh, do, you know, again, do with that information what you will. But like, there's other groups out there like Pantera Capital, Coinbase, Paradigm, the most notably, who a large part of their venture portfolio um, are companies that are backed. Uh, or, or invested into via tokens or have token funds. So we looked at that and said, like, there are some really great companies out there that we could invest into. We weren't going to invest in meme coins or like yeah. playoffs of like, you know, famous companies. Like, I know that there's a like Grok coin yeah. that came out after Elon put out Grok on Twitter. We obviously wouldn't do something like that. You look very deeply all the time through uh, coin ex- exchanges and databases to see what are the best performing ones. We look at who are the investors in some of those 
assets that we're, and companies that we're looking at? And do we think that they can either sustain their price or do we think a death spiral, you know, within a year or also we look at it as an alternative way to invest in some companies if you know, our, if we don't find that there's any like attractable startups on the right CF side to invest into. That makes so, sense. So, you know, if it's something where like, for instance, during the spring where Republican we fund are just, uh, notoriously have a downturn because of uh, when a lot of startups decide to end their raises to us, we looked at that and said like, okay, the publicly traded digital asset space is always going. There are always companies raising through tokenomics and public sales and community airdrops and things of that nature, we can play around in that space. Do I think Republic Note was a great thing? Yes and no. I think it was really great to give people access to the Republic portfolio, mm -hmm. but it's also important to understand that um, I feel U.S. retail investors got shifted because Republic themselves have actually done a equity crowdfunding raise in U.K., for Republic itself, no note. So I question the... Wait, can you elaborate on that last point a little bit more? Sure. So Republic itself has a European marketplace called Cedars, which okay. is essentially like Republic, but for European startups, you can actually go into their marketplace and you can see that Republic once raised on Cedars. Cedars. And so I feel that... Um, like while giving people access in, in, in a sense and quasi like involvement in, you know, sort of a venture fund model, I kind of, um, compared the Republic note to a, um, investment fund that you would invest into on the stock market where basically these, um, you know, the, the rev share is sort of like a dividend model. Ultimately, I, f you know, I feel like, um, a lot of people would have felt more, uh, energetic more thrilled if republic had just raised an actual reg sense. cf for itself yeah to really use the reg cf aspect so i mean if, if we fund involved, doing it if start, it, like, I'll, I'll put it to you like this if we fund it is letting their users invest into them and start engine is doing it what makes republic any better why are they not doing it yep yeah that's that's a, that's a good point especially if they already did it too on cedars so, all right, well, now let's kind of talk about looking forward. What are you excited about looking for the next five years? And then uh, maybe talk about building GRFK and what that's like and maybe some of the challenges that you're experiencing just going through the building process. Yeah. Um, the next five years for Spark, I think that'd be crazy because that would make us 11 years old and that'd be my second startup that hit uh, 10 years or more. But um, I think five years from now, you'll probably see us doing a little bit of what we're still doing now. You might see us doing, I openly said, I would love to be able to raise, you know, funds through mm -hmm. uh, Republic or WeFunder for, for Spark or some of its other companies. Um, I know we're talking to some um, providers out there about launching community-backed funds, whether that's... that's interesting. You know, through Sweater or some other participants out there in the in the startup space that do offer um, involvement to non accredited and accredited investors. So we we think you know there's a, a lot of different ways that we can do things. Um, I don't think we'll ever do a Spark ICO. I just think that that's relatively like stupid. I don't want to compare us to any other groups out there, but I think my goal would be to get us on the same name wavelength as others out there like trust fund or um some of these other big name vcs who i respect and i i admire and i i love the you know what what they do for startups as well you know if i if i can get somebody in in a conversation to think of spark while I'm discussing about them i think at the end of the day i've done my job but it's also more i'm more focused on how do I support startups? What can we do on, on that end? Um, and also incubating our own startups as well, which is always something fun to do. We've, we've done that with a few different companies. Um, the GRFK is really a passion project of mine. Um, it's taking the lessons that I've learned and the lessons that I've learned in 
from others and the mistakes that I've seen others make over the last 10, 11 years in social and entertainment in consumer uh, behavior and transactions and really, you know, combining to create, uh, you know, uh, uh, those are websites as a, a social and entertainment company that intersects content, culture, creative, and consumerism. So um, explain more about that intersection. Yeah. So and culture and uh, creative consumerism. So yeah. Culture, I'm imagining that it could be a subset within a culture, right? So maybe like the culture within the gaming community or the culture within, let's say, pop music, the culture within hard rock, right? Yeah. Um, to some extent, I'm saying there, there's a really great quote. I, I forget who said it. But they said that um, pop culture drives wider culture. The wider culture drives global culture in that. And so I've always really stuck to that quote, sort of a, a, a mindset, you know. And whether that means like we're working in the music space, maybe it's under, you know, um, just in general working with underrepresented voices. Maybe it's us as a social and entertainment company doing our own merchandise and, and helping others doing their own merchandise and pop-up shops and, you know, high ticket areas. Maybe it's highlighting, you know, people that have unique stories or, or you know, building um, social brands that really transcend um, fiction and reality. And then at the same time, yeah, you know, with creative, like that's another big part of it. Creatively, where it's, um, we have different aspects of the business because we're, you know, multi brand engine essentially, where we can work with entertainment companies and, and media partners and brands out there to do ad sales and, and creative packaging and media rights and all sorts of other things. With our entertainment companies, we have our own music label, we have our own. That's content awesome. production and um, IP companies. So we are creating our own entertainment library that then we can license out to book and third party for TV, film, consumer product, whatever the case may be. We have our you know our own talent agency that's up and in the influencer management space. You know we have Spark, which does a lot of co investing. Uh, with GRFK uh, in, in nature so that there's really this great flywheel. You know, I look at companies like Skybound, you know, the creators of The Walking Dead, who, mm. you know, for transparency, we invested into. I'm a big nerd. Amazon has a flywheel of how every part of the business can intersect. The same thing where if you look at companies like Disney or Warner Brothers, every aspect of their business has some other department whose hands are part of that thing it so you know that's sort of the you know the idea that we've taken up but we think all these four c's is really i like to call them you know it's sort of a a nod to like the four p's that we were all taught in in, in school these are really what drive us these are our pillars these are what i've been good at for the last 10 years of my career and ultimately i know the company is going to be good at that because my finger's on the pulse with things. I hear a lot of things that are going on in the entertainment industry or in other areas. And a lot of times I've predicted what's going to happen years before. I hate that. I don't wish that uh, ability on anybody, but it's nice to know um, <laughs> when that does happen. We're like, huh, I guess I was right. It's a good competitive um, advantage for you. No, I, I think a lot differently than other people because I grew up having autism. So like sometimes there's wild, crazy, nonsensical ideas where I'm like, I think this is great. Um, and then like I can see some ideas being made from some of those like smartest, most amazing companies and be like, this is an absolute dumb idea. This is going to backfire. And you know, whether I get criticism for it or not as a person, I could care less. My batting average at this point with guessing things is where I'm like, yeah, I think I've got a better, better betting average than most players in the MLB do, you know? Yeah, well, that's pretty good. And I'm excited to watch you continue to build GRFK. 
and you know excited to see what Spark does in the next yep. couple of years and the companies that Spark's going to invest in. But where can people, where can the listeners find you? You can find me on social media. My typical handle is Taze the God. I I plan on changing that out throughout the year or so. I'm I'm working on various and trying to secure various other handles to sort of clean up the image now that I've been in content in the public facing world for 12 years. For Spark, at least, where people can find Spark is we are gca.com or Spark GCA on Twitter and Instagram. Um, for GRFK, uh, our website is grfk.xyz and then grfk co uh co and twitter and instagram but like i'm also on linkedin as well i probably am checking linkedin maybe once a day but i would say i'm more active on twitter yeah well tristan thanks for coming on we appreciate it and for all the listeners out there we'll see you next time on the next episode of next big thing hq so long Thank you.